Hi guys, this would be my third video in the Vintage Integrated Circuit Series and perhaps the least interesting, but I'll do my best. This is the DF320 loop disconnect dialer and these chips were given to me uh, at a previous electronics company I worked at by the quality assurance officer and it still beats me why. Um, they win for obscurity and how utterly obsolete and useless they are now. He also printed the data sheet up for me, which I lost for a long time until I recently uh, had to get some carpet cleaning done and found them again. And these were produced to replace a mechanical rotary dialer for a telephone. So what do we mean by loop disconnect dialer? Well, we'll see just now. If we connect an LED and battery in series with a, a current limiting resistor, we can see that it does actually drop the line for a short time when you're pulse dialing, just as if you're hanging up. And indeed, when telephones used to have locks on the dial, you could dial a number by quickly pressing the hang up button uh, in uh, successive intervals uh, to dial out a number without using the rotary dial at all. And this is what this chip does. It comes with a bunch of schematics for different implementations, which I don't have to complete because I don't want to connect it to a phone. I'm also using a 4 MHz crystal instead of 3.57 because I've got a whole bunch of powers of 2 crystals. 3.57 MHz is a little harder to find and more expensive these days. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here and show you the thing pulsing out uh, a number pressed into the keypad and then back up a little bit and uh, have a little closer look at a few things. But right now uh, we can individually press numbers and flash them out of an LED. I want something a little more visual than this for a video, but this is your, your basic chip circuit. And also ask myself the question if we could use this with a microcontroller, but let's take a look at this keypad arrangement first. Here's your typical matrix keypad arrangement that you'd be familiar with if you're doing microcontrollers. You pick whether or not your rows or columns are going to be inputs or outputs, it's one or the other. So in this case, uh, the x-axis are inputs here that are normally tied low with a resistor. And because the x-axis are inputs, the y-axis would be outputs. Uh, you could reverse that, but that's the way this diagram is going. Um, so in your outer loop in whatever language you're using you would cycle through uh, these Y lines turning uh, say Y1 which would be Y0 um, I didn't draw this but uh, start from Y1 turn it on then turn it off turn uh, Y2 high then low and then 3 and then 4 and uh, a matrix keypad today might have 12 or 16 keys so for the 12 keypad you'd have uh, a star and a hash across here um, in your inner loop, while Y1 is high, you'd uh, then cycle X1, X2, X3 and check whether you're receiving a high input. So while Y1 was high, if you ran through and uh, found X1 was low because it was getting pulled low with a resistor, but found X2 was high, you'd know that this key was getting pushed because uh, <laughs> the, the current was being provided through Y1 and uh, sunk into X2 and you'd detect a low there. Then you could exit your inner and outer loop and you'd know the key that was being pressed. For the arrangement in this chip, uh, this chip wants to turn itself off and go to sleep after a period of inactivity or when you hang up or whatever. So um, the clock isn't actually running, it's turning its oscillator off most of the time um, to save power. So it can't actually continually scan through a row or a column because it hasn't got a clock. So it has to detect, well, with the use of these transistors, we could assume that all of these lines are pulled high and that they're all inputs. And the chip is essentially off waiting for a low signal to turn back on so it can start scanning the keypad again. So if we were to push, uh, say, button three, and uh, we know that Y1 is being tied high, but that'd be happening inside the chip. So there'd be a resistor in here along all of them, actually. Uh, we'd have uh, current flowing into the base of this transistor uh, through the emitter to ground, which would be pulling X3 low as well. And we do get some current flow through the base out the emitter. So we're pulling Y1 low and X3 low. And uh, 
both of these would be normally high. These columns would probably be awed internally into the chip uh, to one line that just turns the chip on when it sees a low signal. But we could say, for the sake of argument, that any of these pulled low will turn the chip on, start the oscillator again, and then it can begin to, well it already knows now which one of these three were pressed, and it can begin to cycle these again because it's been started back up, and uh, it will find, if it was key three, that uh, Y1 is being pulled low through the transistor to ground here. X3 is also being pulled low, and we've determined that button three is pressed, and the chip will keep going until a period of activity or inactivity uh, when it turns off again. So that was probably the most interesting thing I found out, or well, you know, found with the chip. Uh, I haven't seen this arrangement before, but basically it doesn't have to do anything while it's in low, low power mode to detect the key press. So moving on to connecting the chip's pulse output to the clock of a decade counter to make things a little bit more visible, we can see that entering a digit at a time uh, is a bit more visible for video on a row of LEDs. And we can enter a digit at a time and see the result even though it's reset straight after. And that's because I'm using a mask signal provided by the chip as a reset input for the decade counter. I've had to invert that or it just holds the uh, decade counter in reset the whole time. Uh, if I had a, a better option chip, I'd have a mask 2 signal which could be used to uh, maybe do the same thing in a situation where we're entering into the keypad faster than the chip can pulse out. It has a 20 digit rolling buffer because we can obviously dial a number faster than the chip can pulse out. It has a regulated speed which is configurable depending on the country and the telephone exchange you're using. Um, so we could use this as input for something, but if we've got a decade output, we really might as well have connected the keypad directly to whatever input that was going to be connected to. So still useless. For this chip, if any digits are entered in faster than they can be output, we end up with a cumulative counter, which would be much harder to interpret. Of course, you could simply connect the pulse output straight to a microcontroller to use this chip today, but you wouldn't really save anything. You could count the duration between pulses, which is different from the duration between digits. But yeah, you have a slow, unresponsive keypad that's useless. I should mention that the chip has a last number redial memory, so long as it uh, continues to see power, it is allowed to go to sleep, and so long as you have the extra button that wasn't on the keypad schematic. And so long as you enter the number fast enough originally to keep the buffer full. Alright, catch us next time.